Hi, Jacob Field here from Ripe House Advisory. Uh, filming this video at the beginning of February in 2023, around a snapshot of the, pro the overall property investment opportunity or the landscape for property investment, both right now in February 2023 and what the year ahead has got to get. I warn you now, this is going to get uh, deep, I guess, meaningful, uh, you know, a bit full on very quickly. Um, I'm leaving the, the, the nerd hat on today and really trying hard to break it down. Um, but we will be getting our teeth right into some really interesting new research that is very relevant to all property investors right now as of today. Um, you know, 2022 is over. Um, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. What has 2023 got in store? The last 12 months have seen, you know, a high inflationary environment, uh, negative real interest rates for much of the year. Um, interest rates obviously increasing throughout 2022, and there's lots of chatter at the moment about that set to continue. So where to for 2023? Is it the time to be even talking or purchasing property? Uh, and how can we potentially tread very, very carefully to even survive or thrive in uh, the coming 12 months? So let's dive in. I will keep this nice, short and sharp, but it will get heavy very quickly. So let's move my head out of the way. We have to remember both now and in bull, you know, positive sentiment markets that our number one priority always needs to be capital growth. Now, I like to make my money early, my return early. Think of it in terms of, would you prefer to have 10% growth this year and then no growth for two years or no growth for two years and then 10% growth? You definitely want to front end your capital growth, uh, your returns on any investment generally, and then that allows you to benefit from time value of money. You know, you can reinvest that, you can continue going forth. Number one priority, strong capital growth. We have a short term focus. We want to front end our capital growth as much as possible, but not at the expense of long term capital growth. Now, this is our absolute number one priority. We want and demand high capital growth, high yield investments, and increasing rents very quickly in those investments. Um, this might sound like a difficult combination or even an unobtainable combination, um, but it's all well and good for me to say, let's go and do this. It's a big call to say that. How can we back up an actual methodology or demonstrate an actual methodology and back up this statement with actual acquisitions and a theory or a process to be able to do that? So let's dive right in. The best way that I can think of in doing so is to actually show you our results. This is our secret weapon. This is the algorithm that we've been uh, publicly released. You can see here, I'll move my head once again. Um, we were released the suburb recommendations that came out of our core algorithm. Uh, firstly, in 2015, and it was part of a story here, you can see here on Money Magazine, a lot of what we do has always been down to a street and a property level, where we identified the 133 best streets uh, in that Money Magazine article. That's where we really started at a, national, at, a, at a public level, talking about capital growth locations. And the algorithm was really, I guess, a pioneer in this AI data, uh, big data analytics space within Australia. And you can see here the results. Uh, since 2015, uh, the gold line is the Ripe House approved locations. Each th three months, we stack the results on top of each other. And you can see here the white line is the uh, ABS capital city weighted average, but then it moves over to the new data set that ABS have in the last year or so, um, which is the total value of property in Australia, and we track the changes there. You can see here, even when the ABS data, which is the core of Australian property data, uh, is going up and down, is wavering, we keep powering forward, and you'll see why in a moment. And you can see even through the last 12 months or 2022, when property prices did go backwards at a national level, uh, we had a little bit of a slowdown, but it still kept powering forward quite well. And I have to say, with we're, this is a, a constant uh, uh, area for in focus and improvement as a business. We spend very heavily on improving our data and intelligence and algorithmic capabilities, uh, and it just keeps getting better. The rubber really does hit the road. Um, you can see over since 2015, this weighted capital city average is still under a 50% return. Um, we have pushed almost 4.5 times higher than that 
uh, aggregate. This is the power of stronger, higher than normal compounding. Over time, the benefits really does separate from the normal. So enough about the results and where we've sort of done. I, I don't like to go down that path too much. It's just to show you that this is possible. How does this all work? Now, this is where it might get a little bit nerdy. Okay, I use the image on the right-hand side just to signify that it is the combination of, uh, you know, data, artificial intelligence and algorithmic uh, solutions uh, and technology, but it does require the human touch. Okay, this is what I learned to program on. It's a 1980s BBC microcomputer. I was quite young when we had this in the house and I did uh, teach myself to software program well, about 35 years ago now. <laughs> okay, and I did go on to work professionally as a software engineer with a particular data and algorithmic focus. Uh, and I was a hired gun, I, I guess, for some big companies across Australia, you know, Optus News Limited, Fox Sports, and a few others. I was brought in there to, to bring uh, my software engineering skills, data um, research skills to solve these commercial problems. I'll resist the nerdy talk, but there are some key concepts where this is going to get really, really sharp very, very quickly. And like, uh, you know, if all other property research conversations scratch the surface, we're going to be going three or four layers deep today uh, very, very quickly. How does this all work? At a really high level, this is the nuts and bolts of the uh, data science process within the Ripe House Advisory algorithm and what we do here. We have an index data. In really simple terms, for each suburb across Australia, we have uh, an accurate representation of how property prices have changed in those suburbs over time. That gives us an index. So over time, we can see the baseline of how these areas are changing in value. We then go out and we strategize what factors can potentially allow us to predict future price movement. You know, we might think, is it the color of the walls or is it the number of bedrooms or is it the number of Mercedes in the suburb or is it the number of trees per street or, um, you know, days on market or vacancy rates or those traditional property metrics or any other. We are just ingesting as much data as we can get hold of, and then we are using machine learning algorithms to try and find a correlation between those factors and the index, the underlying index movements. Once we find correlations, a factor may have a very small influence or correlation to future price movement or past price movements, and therefore predicted future movements, or a very strong cor cor correlation. When we find a, a variable or a metric or a factor that does have a strong correlation to price movements, it becomes what we call in the industry an alpha factor. These factors are what we use to combine together to, to allow us to select or rank suburbs that are more likely to grow in value stronger than the normal. These alpha factors are absolute gold. How does this actually look in reality? Okay, so this is <laughs> as good as uh, probably the most visual way we can demonstrate the algorithm. Okay, um, the actual, you know, the actual Z score, the actual change in value over time is on the vertical axis. The predicted score is on the horizontal axis. axis. Now, in really simple terms, the closer the blue line, which is the line of best fit, Every one of those black dots is a suburb over the sample period. Um, you know, some of them we predicted, like these ones down here, we predicted that it was going to grow in value very strongly, but it actually went backwards. Some of them we predicted that it was going to grow in value very strongly, and it did. Some of them we predicted that it's not going to grow very strongly uh, or even negatively, and it grew quite strongly. So sometimes there's some outliers there that are f further away um, from the from the from the line of best fit, which is the blue line. I'll get to that in a moment. The further these ones are away from that blue line, it means that the algorithm got it more wrong. But overall, you can definitely see a very strong trend here, uh, where the line of best fit, which I guess is the average of all of these these dots, these suburbs, is very close to a 45 degree curve. The closer it is to 45 degrees, that line of best fit, that blue line, the uh, the closer the algorithm is at predicting these areas that are going to grow strongly in value. Or, you know, negatively in this case, it's, it's going in both directions. But we're trying to get this blue line 
at a 45 degree angle. That's what all of these resources are about. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It does get a little bit deep very quickly. What are these factors? Okay, what are these alpha factors that we look at? Now, there are 26 alpha factors. These combine together to help our uh, intelligence to predict short and midterm capital growth. So there's actually two models that run over the top of each other and we combine them together. And that's really specializing in zero to one to, or one to two uh, years in sh terms of short term growth. We want properties that really do perform from day zero of purchase through to a mid uh, capital growth model, which is you know that two to three years out to a five year period out from five years. You know, it really is so many factors that can change dramatically that we can't really quantify. So that zero to five year period, we've got very good at predicting. Now, as I mentioned before, these 26 alpha factors are not all created equal. And this is, uh, in fact, I'll probably go one step to f further to say the number one most important alpha factor, you know, that's probably, probably putting in another way, the number one factor that we have determined most strongly uh, predicts future price performance is nine times more important than number 26. Okay, and this is something that I really commonly hear that property people, uh, property investors or property researchers or other you know professionals in the industry, they just don't really grasp this as a concept. They think that all variables, all metrics, all data points are created equal. Um, you know, and we're finding a suburb that lines up on each of them. Uh, where it's just not the case. It's not that simple. Every variable needs to be, I guess, looked at in terms of its relative influence on our on the predictive algorithm. Okay, each variable then needs to be, I guess, rated per suburb and a weightage applied uh, before um, the influence of that variable is uh, um, applied to the overall suburb. And probably to to uh, illustrate this visually, you can see here I have hidden this metric. It is the most important alpha factor that we have identified in predictive analysis. It's not actually one that you ever hear of really being talked about um, in the media or in other sources of property research or information. And that's generally the case because the ones that you hear of most often are usually the ones that are uh, most commonly or cheaply or broadly available. And some of the most important alpha factors are very expensive, very private, uh, and very difficult to gather. But once you actually find that correlation, they are absolute gold. Now, this one has a relative influence score. It is an arbitrary number of 18.5, right? To give you some context, something like a vacancy rate, which is a very common number that is used, and I'll show you in a moment, is, a, is about one ninth as important as this variable. And you'd think vacancy rate is very important. Well, it's just not. It is important, but it's only one of the 26 variables. And then we also have some tolerances here. So you can see here this variable, how it relates to the, uh, the predicted performance of the market. So you can see this particular variable here on the bottom, and I don't have a, an axis or a label here for you guys, but when this variable is negative, so when it's negative two, sorry, I'll go back. When this variable is has a value, an actual raw value of minus 20% or minus 0 0.2, it actually has a very strong correlation to future performance. Okay, the Z score is up actually over two. And you can see here, I'll just move this again. This is an inverse relationship. So the higher this variable becomes, the lower the predicted performance of that location. You can see this when this is really in negative territory. It's right up here off the charts in terms of the predicted future performance in, in property prices in this location. And when it is zero, we are almost at break even. So you can see this here and you can, you can track it. And from this, we're able to really assess what tolerances... Uh, we are willing to accept. And in this case for this variable, we're willing to accept just over 0% because that's where a lot of the suburbs in this country fall. Remember, we are running this suburb through a series of these factors and we want to be left with a few that we can actually target. Um, no suburb is ever perfect all the way through the 26 variables. And to give you some idea, I have shown you this one. Vacancy rates, obviously the number of vacant properties available for rent compared to the overall number of properties in the suburb. Um, the relative influence score of this is under two. 
So it's nine times less or even more than nine times less important than that first variable that we looked at. But you can see here, once again, this has an inverse relationship. Um, our maximum acceptable value here is 4% vacancy rates. And you can see here as vacancy rates drop down under, you know, right down here to one zero percent um, we have a, a po positive, a, a positive uh, correlation or a positive <laughs> a correlation to future predicted performance. We we can see that trend line. It's not as sharp as the first factor. The relative influence, the correlation is not as strong, but you definitely can see how it does relate to that predicted performance. So this is a really good example for these common data points. Another great one, days on market. It's a data point that we hear talked about all the time. It doesn't even move the dial in terms of our algorithm. It's not even one of the top 26 variables that we saw that has that influence um, or factor or, or relationship with um, future price performance. We use days of supply that has a very a far more predictive and accurate uh, or related relationship. Um, and you know far more so than days on market, and that's one that we don't actually hear talked about as often, but it is far more important. And I did mention this before. Some of these data points are very expensive to gather, um, and they only belong in the world of private advisory. So vacancy rates here way down our list of 26, but it is on there. Now, when does the rubber hit the road? All right, I'm going to show you a tool now that is used behind the curtain. This is used in our private advisory practice here. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of data points and terms and things thrown around, um, but it's probably easy that I just show you this tool, okay? Um, this is in our private platform, no users, it's just used for our staff. Um, we've got a lot of money and intelligence that's been spent in this platform and it does power our acquisition side of the business, okay? What you can clearly see here is every suburb in the country. So this is showing us suburb one to 100, and I've got it set on private. So I've hidden the suburb names and the LGA names, but this is the same tool. This is ranked from best to worst, and that is the suburb R score. So that is the combination of all of these factors. We've categorized each suburb into or rank them in terms of best to worst for each of these variables. We've put them into the weightages and the tolerances, and then we've gone through and calculated an overall R score. That's the Ripe House uh, Capital Growth Algorithm score. We've then ranked those and we've given each suburb a percentile. So that has a, a you know a, a relationship or, or, or a, a co you know we, we're able to compare suburb to suburb. So 100 out of 100 is the, the, the best suburbs in the country. It's in the 100th percentile. You can see here we actually have like a big matrix, every value of every variable that is important to our algorithm, okay? These are not in any order. Um, you can see here when it's red, it might not be so great at that particular data point. Um, and when it is blue, it's excellent. It's very good. All right, you can see a lot of these locations have a very high yield, you know, 7.9%, right? We use this, we can filter, we can find, and then we are, um, uh, we can filter, we can find, and we use this day to day in curating and grooming and finding our highest rated suburbs for uh, selection, you know, for actual purchasing. Once we have this list, and this is updated very regularly with our data machine is constantly churning away, and this data is constantly pulled and updated, and then the ordering of these suburbs changes. You know, a suburb that might have been a 96 is now a 99 and vice versa. We're then going through this list, and you can check this on the side here, the vetting signal. We are turning suburbs, or it doesn't really happen very often. It's not like suburbs go from approved or rejected very often. They're either rejected or approved for a certain period of time. But you can see here that these suburbs, whilst number one on our list, absolute numero uno out of over 15,000 investable suburbs, we've rejected it because of the density of the property. It's, it's providing too much new supply risk to the area. And you can see here all of the top 10 were rejected. And we've got the first one approved here. Right, you keep going down the list. We see a few approved in the top 100 locations, I added this up before I did the video, there are only 21 that are approved. And so this is the combination of the algorithms, the data, and the human touch coming together. All right, 
we are only at manually, and this is combined with on the ground walkthroughs, inspections, looking, knowing the market, talking to locals, uh, and then so looking at some of those softer data point elements, like where can new supply be built? Is there new supply being built now? Um, is this a key commuter hub? Is there risk of it sort of going behind the wayside? Has it got higher density or lower density living? We're applying a lot of this softer human touch to the uh, approval or rejection of these locations. And as mentioned, only around one in every four or five suburbs from a data perspective is actually approved for a private advisory acquisition perspective. Um, so that's a really valuable tool that we're using day to day to bring all of this data together and to allow us to approve locations. We've actually got a really, really amazing tool that goes through each of these approved locations and finds all on and off market properties. It's probably another video uh, and it brings them together into the one platform where we can see the level of distress. Um, so we've got our team only focusing on the properties in those suburbs that are ranked most highly and are approved as well. All these systems join together. Location research, property discovery, it's our big internal search engine on and off market. Then we have tools to do the due diligence on those properties. And then we have an approved property pool where we match that to client briefs. Um, it's very, very powerful. So look, on from that, I'll get back to the slides and I am aware of time. Um, how good is this algo, this data, this human touch and you know, technology uh, working together at actually helping people buy a property. Well, it's actually pretty good. That's what it's all about. The rubber has to hit the road. So in the last three months only in performance, as an end-to-end -end advisory and acquisition services uh, service, you have to think about what's been going on. We've had negative property sentiment. We've had interest rates increasing. We've had people going away on holidays, Christmas, all of these things occurring. We've had global unrest and this algorithm, this acquisition service, what we do day to day just keeps plugging away. Because in the last three months, we've just literally taken the data at the end of January, hot off the press, the last three months going back to the end of October, um, all properties, all suburbs across the country had negative 1.48%. And that's what you would expect you know, with all this negativity and property negative negativity going on, you'd expect that nationally properties to go backwards and they have almost one and a half percent. Well, in our approved locations, you can see the resilience we go to in selecting them in this same time period, the approved locations we are looking at, you know, that top echelon of suburbs that are approved have as an aggregate gone up 4.9% in that same period. Okay, it's almost What's that? Almost six and a half percent difference between average and what we're able to achieve in that same period. So that reminds you back to that chart. You can see how that separation occurs. Now, really importantly, we've got a very strong relationship and correlation between areas that are, have strong rental pressure. Rents are going through the roof. In our target locations in this same three month period, we've seen over five percent rental growth. That is once again far higher than the national average and far higher than the national average in terms of rental yield. The average acquisition rental yield over that last three months right now is 6.1%. So even where interest rates are where they are now, um, you've got very strong cash flow positions. That's not even mentioning the actual underlying capital growth that we're able to generate in these times. Um, this is the real story. It's the capital growth. It keeps powering ahead. I'll remind you. In these times, these dips of the white line, and that we're in a dip at the moment, this algorithm, it keeps pushing forward. It keeps finding us local government areas, suburbs, streets, and property types that are set to perform as of right now. We've found the combination of stars aligning. And to prove this once again, this is another chart. Um, it might be a little bit heavy. I'll break it down for us along the bottom we've got the percentiles of each suburb. So of the 15,000 suburbs, think of it in terms of about 150 in each percentile, okay? The worst 150 suburbs are in the first percentile. The best 150 suburbs are in the 100th percentile. And on the vertical axis, we've got the actual capital growth. So we looked at all those 150 suburbs, what was the um, median price on average across those 150 suburbs at the end of October? 
and what is it now and what is the difference? The difference is the three month capital growth percentage for that percentile for those 150 property uh, suburbs. Okay, so lots of property sales. Now, the really interesting thing is, here is you can see the percentile one through to, you know, 17 doesn't really actually have much data at all. You can you can think of these as the basket cases of Australian property suburbs. They really don't really have many properties selling, if at all, no real properties to rent. We don't have much reliable data from them. You know, technically it's called sample, not reliable. These didn't really even move the dial. That's how bad they were. We couldn't even have enough data to accurately uh, equate them. But you can definitely see a very strong trend line. You're around the 20th percentile here through to the 40th percentile of a lot of areas that were the worst, you know, from an algorithmic perspective, and that definitely did perform very poorly over this three month period. And then you can start to see as we get up here towards the 50, 60th percentile, you know, it's starting to get less volatile and we're starting to get closer and closer to positive capital growth in this three month period. And look what happens when we start to get up to the pointy end. When you're up and over the 90th percentile, we are talking about the strongest capital growth suburbs and investment grade locations across Australia for the last three months. This shows you when the rubber hits the road, even though overall we've had so much negative growth and um, poor performance, we can very, very accurately find the strongest capital growth performance at any time, even when the market's going backwards. And you can see here, if you look at the top five percentile, you know, we're talking uh, 750 suburbs across the country. We, we've got uh, average capital growth across those suburbs in the last three months, whilst all this stuff has been happening uh, of around, uh, I would say about 8% capital growth. I have the numbers right here in front of me, and I'll tell you exactly uh, is, so this is a, a, a really quick breakdown. The top 20th percentile, sorry, I'm just bringing up the right spreadsheet really quickly. The top 20th percentile is 2% capital growth over that three month period. The top 10th of percentile of suburbs, 4.9. And that's where we really focus our attention. We go through and pick our eyes out of that top 10%, you know, one in five of those. So it's about 1500 suburbs and only one in five of those is actually approved for us to look. But if you even sharpen that up even more so, the top 5% of investment locations, according to the algorithm, had 8.6% capital growth during that time. That's just not really enough properties for us to sink our teeth into because we want to find those stronger streets and properties within these locations. We want to have a, a few properties to play with in doing that analysis. So hopefully that, sorry about the disruption there. Hopefully that gives you some background in terms of um, you know, how, how those numbers change as we get right up towards the pointy end. So we're playing around in the top 10th percentile. Obviously, um, you know, that's the sweet spot for us. Uh, and then only around one in every four, one in every five of those suburbs actually is approved when we manually vet it. Um, you know, so we're talking about three to 400 suburbs at any one time, only the absolute best of the best. So which states are these uh, locations found in? All right, we've got WA. Um, WA we've been active in now for about three years. Um, it's not increasing in terms of our focus um, it, there's still some great acquisitions to be had with our clients. Um, a lot of clients are wanting to buy in WA for diversification purposes. They're seeing a news article about it. Um, ongoing from this point, it is strategic and technical investments. Um, we are very strongly operating in WA, don't get me wrong, in February 2023. Uh, but there are other areas as well which are emerging very strongly. Um, we've got some key investment grade areas in New South Wales. We've seen a very strong consolidation of that market in key investment grade markets, and that's come on very strongly. South Australia is once again showing a lot of strength. Um, Queensland holding steady, but we are moving back into the Brisbane, greater Brisbane area, and that's including Brisbane proper, with some key investment grade locations in a big way going into February 2023. These are all areas we've been very familiar with, you know, professionally over the last decade, even myself personally for the last two decades as an investor. The key here is rental growth 
and the tightness in the rental market that's not going to create a lot of risk for us for new properties to be built and satisfy that demand. So you have extremely strong rental growth, uh, extremely tight vacancy rates leading to very strong buy, uh, you know, buy price, sold price growth. And this isn't a really good example. This is Steve. He purchased this property in November. So very recent. It's in Queensland. Very tidy property. He said, you're most welcome. I've been extremely happy working with you, providing help and advice. I value your knowledge, advice and friendship that we have built during this journey. That was written about Steve. About Steve. Steve's also part of my organization in terms of the buyer's agent that worked with Steve. Um, we looked at this property recently, it was purchased in November, and we estimate based on the suburb overall, it has generated 5.2% capital growth in that first three months. It was bought for 283,000. It is on the lower end of the general acquisitions. We're seeing 450 to 500 as a great spot to be in, but we're not giving up anything at this 300 or so price point. From 270 all the way up to about $800,000. We've got some great different locations that are applicable to that purchase price at the moment. The appraised value on this property was uh, around $7,000 more than was paid for it. So we had some nice entry into it. And that's using very realistic and pessimistic appraisals of that property. And we'll very, uh, have a very strong background in appraisals uh, within the team. 6.2% was the current market yield on the property and overall the projected recoup of capital the one year return on investment or cash put into the deal was 83 percent for c so this gives you an idea of the type of asset that generates um, it's not a waterfront mansion it's not in a low socio area it's in a very strong affordable growing gentrifying location which is middle australia but in those key markets and that's a really important thing you know just over five percent capital growth in three months this is the type of deal that does it. Another story here from Taki. Um, he purchased in September, a couple of months earlier. This one's over in WA, very low maintenance, modern property. We have estimated Taki has generated 4.1% capital growth in the first four months. Obviously, it hasn't been through a refinance. Uh, we've just looked at other properties that are now selling in the streets around this property. And we've looked at the suburb overall to equate this capital growth. Taki said that the purchasing phase had been completed by your great support. Now I'm entering the, net, the initial rent phase. The new photos are really great. Once again, thank you for your, report, your support. 487 purchase price, appraised rent. So slightly higher purchase price, slight, slightly higher yield. Sometimes there's a trade-off. Taki wanted something that was more modern, lower maintenance. Sometimes uh, there's a lot more depreciation. So after tax cash flows are far stronger for these newer dwellings, you know, three to five years old. But the purchase, uh, the yield on purchase might be a little bit lower. And it was the case here, but still 5.3% rental yield, very, very strong. And we are expecting very high rental growth in this location, which I'll get onto in a moment. All right, so this is more than just capital growth. This is a story of Jack, and he purchased two properties with us in October. We were doing two together with Craig, our buyer's agent, with him. Both of them, you can see here, um, both properties. The first one, the initial rental appraisal, when we're actually making offers and getting the deal done, we appraised the rent on this property at $410. By the time that it actually settled, and we've got a tenant in there, which happened very quickly because it's a very tight rental market, but it only took sort of six weeks in delay. We pushed, 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 and we drove the rental return up to $460 a week when the actual lease was signed. And this is a very consistent story. This is the other property that Jack looked at. 430 was our initial rental appraisal. By the time the lease was actually signed and the property was settled, it was for $570 a week. There was no renos done on either of these properties. That just shows you the heat of these rental markets in the time that you have offer accepted and we're doing the due diligence to the time that it settles, you know, six weeks later, and then a couple of weeks there to get the photos done, the tenants uh, signed on the leases, et cetera. That period when you're talking about really strong rental growth means these numbers. These numbers look very different into our spreadsheet. And this is just a very consistent story that we are seeing at the moment with clients in the last three months. And we're expecting this to continue. We're buying in very, very tightly held rental and buy side markets. This really makes interest repayments extremely uh, pleasant to chew when you see this type of rental increases. Next steps, guys, I can't stress this enough. Um, let's get started.
client success team here. You can call directly through to Catherine, Nick, uh, or Manoja to sit outside of my office here. Uh, 03614601121. That's if you're earlier, you know, in the conversations with us, or hook straight into our property wealth strategist. You might be already having conversations with Julian or Christian or Sam within the business, really fine tuning. Uh, your engagement with us and, and the wealth plan and, and what our strategy is. Or you can reach Julian there, julian at ripehouseadvisory.com.au. So you can see that we have a data-based approach to property investing using exports experts to perform the due diligence. And then this opens up the whole nation for the best growth and cash flow zones. We can excel with this approach as investors right now. We, can't, we don't need to let the market dictate its terms. Um, generally, I see the industry starting to fire after Australia Day, all right? Really busy going into Christmas. The dust settles throughout January. We have seen this week things really starting to move. We want to have leverage in our negotiations. We want to discuss your next investment purchase immediately. We want to get started on this uh, and maintain this leverage that we have right now uh, for the next few weeks, which you generally see in, in February. Um, there are physically very few property opportunities that meet our optimum local government area, suburb, street, and property configurations. Think of it as a big filter, each layer, many, many properties are falling out. And I'm going to film some other videos in the next few weeks. Uh, don't, don't wait for me. I'll, I'll, I'll put them together. Uh, I'll make sure that they're right. I'll make sure they make sense and you'll be the first to know about the street level intelligence, about the property selection that we do do. But you have to think as they go through this filter, even though we're looking out across this large country, there are very few properties that meet our requirements. We are very fussy with our requirements. So therefore, you receive the benefit of that fussiness. Um, we are also very fussy with who we work with, and I'll be very upfront and honest about that. So talk to Julian in particular or Christian or, or Sam, uh, you know, our wealth strategists and advisors. Um, discuss your criteria. Discuss whether you qualify or are a good fit for working with us. We have to make sure of that. We don't want to waste either of our time, um, but we need to move quickly. There are very few properties that meet these requirements. Uh, and there are some, some great negotiations going on right now. So hopefully that gives you some idea about what we do behind the scenes. We're on standby for any questions. Sorry if it got a little bit heavy and deep there, um, but I think it's definitely worthwhile unpacking what we do day to day. This is where the gold can be mined in these environments.